Welcome back, everyone. Um, this is a continuation of my video series on restoring a 1932, I believe, um, Delco 16-inch desk fan or table fan. In this video, we're going to do the final assembly and wiring. It should be a rocking good time for those of you interested in this sort of topic. But for those of you who are easily bored, um, I suggest you watch something else because this is going to be long and it's going to be treacherous. Um, so I've already assembled, partially assembled the unit. Um, we've got the motor housing mounted to the um, to the swivel neck, which is then mounted to the base. In this part, I'm actually pointing out some of the flaws in the paint job. One of the issues I've had painting this fan is the normal limitations with painting with spray cans outdoors. Um, I don't have an indoor spray booth, and I'm only limited by the cost and materials that I'm willing to spend the amount of money. Um, I've actually lacquered the data plate and reinstalled it with the original rivets. Um, I, I did not, uh, the way I put the rivets back in was I used some of my favorite Loctite glue gel, which is an amazing product. I use it for everything. Um, it should be a nice, good, permanent install. And preserving the original rivets preserves a lot of the fan's character. Um, but yeah, it is, a, it is not by any means a flawless paint job. It was a very inexpensive paint job and a very quick one at that. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. We're going to start wiring up the stator. And as you can see, I've got the, um, the original wiring is still lashed to the coils with cotton thread. And what we're going to have to do now is cut away some of that thread and expose the terminations. Um, I want to point out that this is a very simple motor to rewire. If you're starting out in the fan restoration hobby, I would highly recommend you find a model of fan that uses a speed coil rather than multiple coils um, in the motor shell. And I say that because the wiring is vastly simpler. Uh, on a motor like this one. There are simply two wires going from the coil down to the base of the fan. Uh, makes it easier to find replacement head wire um, as you don't have to source out. So let's say you're using a custom wire like I'm using on this one. I went with a, a gold rayon woven wire. And to find a three or four conductor uh, wire in that finish is nearly impossible. But because this fan uses a simple two wire um, method of uh, wiring up the, the coil, um, I did not have to go chasing down a, uh, a golden goose or a unicorn. I just used the wire that I, that I bought for the um, power cord and, and that was it. And that's what we're gonna work with today. If you're interested in working with that type of wire, there are some things in this video I wanna point out that you need to pay attention to because when you're working with reproduction and vintage wire, um, you need to be aware of a couple of things. Number one, it is not UL listed wire. So if for insurance reasons or what have you, um, commerce reasons, you need to know that. The second thing is that particular style of wire um, is not made in the way of the old fashioned uh, cloth wrapped wire. Originally, cloth wrapped wire was made from um, copper wire that was coated in either rubber or gutta percha or a combination of the two. And it was then wrapped, um, it was actually the strands were lashed together with an exterior, um, like a braided uh, or woven wire, I'm sorry, woven cotton thread that was either dyed or coated. Uh, with some other substance. And in this in this particular scene, you can actually see uh, some of that original wire is actually in really good condition um, because it's been hidden away over underneath the uh, that electrical tape. Now the electrical tape that they used to use back then is basically cloth that was dipped in a resin or a tar and then wrapped in position. And it was okay because it didn't really get moved around much. But as you can clearly see, I'm moving it around now and it's crumbling in my fingers. And you can see my fingers are getting covered in black tar. 
And another thing I want to point out is when you get down to this point in the wiring of that coil, this is where you have to really, really, really be careful. Because in some cases, you may end up breaking wire off. That is bad because then you have to dig the wire back into the coil and then lash onto it. Um, I've done a lot of these motors over the years, so I, I feel like I know what I'm doing. Some of you might have better ideas, better methods than I do, but um, that's great. Um, but what I, one of the things I like to do is I try to preserve as much of the wire as I can, and that I'm not going to simply cut that right off. I'm going to try to melt the solder and unwrap the wire, the, 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 sh the head wire going over the coil wire. And I'm gonna try to unwrap it. In some cases, it's not easy to do, maybe impossible. But you wanna reduce the amount of wire loss going into the coil, and you wanna reduce the amount of fatigue exposed to that wire. You also wanna be cautious of the amount of heat you're applying to that wire. Remember, motors are wound simply with um, copper wire that's been coated in enamel. Enamel that is in this case 87 years old. So you don't want to heat it up too much. You don't want to flex it too much. You really want to be careful. Treat it with kid gloves or handle with kid gloves and uh, tread lightly is, uh, is the name of the game here. So what we're doing here is we're simply unsoldering the wire as best we can without causing too much damage to the wire going into the coil. If you do break off a wire, it isn't the end of the world. It depends on which wire you break off and uh, how deep into the coil it is. It also depends on how difficult it is to access the other side of the coil. In this case, the motor, the coil is basically pressed into uh, the very thick steel motor casing. I couldn't get it out, not without causing any damage. And that was my situation. I hope it's not yours. Let's move on. Okay, now we've reached a point in the project where we need to remove the um, slag and flux and anything that doesn't belong on a conducting end of a wire. We also want to make sure to preserve as much of that uh, enamel as we can. We don't want to take off any more than we have to. If we do, the next step uh, should actually solve that problem that we've created. Um, but the next step is something that I like to do as a safety measure um, on any old fan coil that I work on. And that is to simply sleeve as much of the, ex the, the wire that's coming out of that coil as possible with a very thin shrink tube. Shrink tube is a, is a necessity when you're wiring up an old appliance like this. I use it, I use it almost religiously. Um, I wire up my car stereos with the shrink tube. It's the greatest stuff on earth. Um, and there's a little piece right there. We're going to cut that. I, I buy it in a variety pack. You can get it from Harbor Freight. You can get it from any electronics store, really anywhere. Um, the stuff is easy to get, and it's not that expensive, and it's easy to work with. You just cut to size, slide it over the wire, apply heat, and you're done. As for a heat source, I use a cigarette lighter. I don't smoke. But most electronics I work on do. That was a joke. You may laugh now. Okay, so there we go. I'm going to cut the other piece for the other wire. And that is this, that is kind of an insurance plan for me. Um, I don't trust 87-year-old enamel wire that's been flexed and moved around and jostled. I just uh, don't really want to burn my house down, and uh, I'm sure you don't either. So that's why I, I go the extra mile, and I sleeve anything that's exposed, and I shove that stuff as far back as I can. And thus far, I've never had a problem. Okay, at this point, we're taking some of that uh, new shiny gold um, rayon uh, woven wire, and we're applying a little bit of shrink tube on it as well. And that is, and unfortunately I didn't pan the camera correctly, but we're applying the shrink tube to the wire to prevent fraying. One of the things you have to know about this wire is that you cannot cut it anywhere on the wire without, um, you can't cut it, you can't splice it, you can't do anything without protecting, first protecting that very delicate woven outer or uh, outer weaving. 
And what I do is I take some shrink tube and I apply it a couple inches back from where my splice was going to be. And I then heat it up, shrink it down, make my splice, and then I shrink tube all the splices that I make. But most importantly, the reason you want to shrink tube the, the, the weaving before you start cutting is it will unravel, it will pull back. Um, it's basically a Chinese finger trap um, made out of cloth. And it's not bonded to the inner jacketing at all. Um, it's really just slid on there by machine and it can be easily slid right off. So you wanna be very careful when pulling, tugging, or otherwise manipulating or splicing the wire. You want to protect the end of that, um, that uh, rayon sleeve the best you can. And what we're doing now is we're using a utility knife. We're, we're cutting around the, um, the jacketing. And then once I finish that, I'm gonna see what I'm doing. I'm sliding that shrink tube right over the, the splice of the, uh, of, of the uh, rayon. And then once it touches the black inner casing, we're going to shrink it down. And then we can manipulate the black, uh, the black inner rubber. Um, we're just gonna cut that with a knife and then we're going to strip back the insulation on the two conductors within. Real simple stuff, anyone can do it. Um, but just a couple of things that you need to know before you start tearing into this stuff because I've learned the hard way um, and I don't make my mistakes twice. Sometimes, I usually, well, sometimes I, sometimes. Okay, so now you can see the two conductors are individually jacketed. Um, thank God, because uh, if they weren't, we'd have a whole new set of problems on our hands. We're gonna just slightly cut into the end of the outer insulation. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically use the wires as tearing strips, and we're going to tear them back through the insulation to prevent nicking the inner insulation of the conductors themselves. Um, this is a trick that I figured out um, when I first, when I wired up my Victor Junior, I used a similar product, um, only it was a black with yellow accents. There we go, we're gonna use a cigarette lighter to shrink that down. There we go. Uh, but we're gonna pull the wire. I, see if I, I wonder if I show that on camera. Let me, uh... Okay, there we are. So we're pulling it back and then we're gonna cut the uh, excess insulation off. And then we're going to strip just enough wire back from the, uh, from the conductors to make our solder connection. We want those solder connections to be relatively small and unobtrusive. There we go. Pretty good stuff, simple stuff. Alrighty. So at this point, we've twisted the one of the conductors and we're just soldering it in place. I'm using a fairly hot iron because I want it to, I want it to be done quick. I don't want it to heat up for half an hour. Then. No, no, no. I'm using my soldering gun for this, but a 40 watt iron will do you just fine. I wouldn't use anything smaller than that. And I'm using rosin core leaded solder because it has a lower melting point than lead free solder, actually by quite a bit. And it flows very nicely. And there we go, there's one done and one more to go. Now, one of the things I've done, I, I didn't show this on camera, but I added a second larger sleeve of string tube that is going to cover the solder joint. And then we're going to fold the solder joint back Make sure the solder joint does not have any sharp edges or anything that could stick through the shrink tube. Um, and we're gonna fold it down with a pair of pliers to get a nice sharp bend. And we're gonna slide the, that sleeve right over the, right over the joint, heat it up with a, uh, with a heat source. You can use a soldering iron, you can use a um, cigarette lighter, you can use a heat gun, doesn't really matter. You just want it to shrink. Just don't burn it and you're good to go. And we're gonna do that again. I don't need to show that on camera, but we're gonna do the same thing with the neutral wire. A little word about neutral hot on an antique appliance like this one. Um, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, I, as far as I know, the, uh, the chassis of the fan is not conducted, connected directly to the coil in any way or the switch. I will point out though, that the switch handle, as you'll see later in the video, is 
directly connected to um, power uh, lead, either hot or neutral. But the thing is, back in the day, they did not use polarized plugs on, on, on most appliances. It wasn't really necessary, it wasn't required. So on a device like this, it never had a polarized plug. There was no polarity, it was just whatever went wherever. It just didn't matter. Um, but we're more conscious of that today. And we would do things very differently on a modern device. But back then, not really a thing. Moving on. So I hemmed and hawed over this for quite a while. I was going to lash the, um, the connection to the windings as it had been originally uh, with thread. Uh, they use cotton thread. I was going to use nylon. Um, but ultimately, I decided that the zip ties were a better choice because they're very strong. They're proven. And this is a um, this also serves as a pseudo strain relief. If you were to tug on the wire, something strong has to be there to prevent that from being pulled right out. So I'm using zip ties, um, just a personal preference, uh, but some of you more historically accurate restorers might do something a little different. And the more historically accurate viewers aren't going to be watching my videos for advice anyway, so there you go. But anywho, <laughs> We've got that all pretty much done. Now, if I were to slide the uh, the, um, the armature back in and power up that motor, it would it should spin. But we're not going to do that because we don't have the grommets to put back into the rear motor housing cover. We don't have the grommets for the base, and we just well we just don't have the grommets. So we're, we can't really go too much farther in this without those grommets. Uh, I'm going to quickly test fit the uh, the motor backing, but I think all is going to be well. Now let's wait for those grommets to come in and we're going to continue on. Let's talk about lubrication of the gearbox. So I use um, automotive grease. Um, you know, some people may not like that idea. They may have their own, their own opinions, but opinions like assholes, um, everybody has one. And we'll just, can we all just agree that any lubricant made today is better than what they originally would have used. Can we just agree on that? Thanks. Um, anything made today would be is better than what they used originally. Because what they originally used would often just harden right up and it would just pack into the corners of the gearbox and the fan would run basically without any lubrication of any kind for years, decades even, and you would never know. <laughs> you would never know because you're not cracking this thing open every once in a while to check. Most people don't. This stuff here, this is um, it's Bell Ray waterproof grease. It's designed for marine, motorcycle, and automotive applications. Um, yeah, it's probably not the right stuff, but really what is the right stuff I mean the manufacturer would have recommended a product back then that hasn't been made in decades so it doesn't matter at this point so I'm gonna pop this gear back in there and we're gonna put this washer back on top of the gear everything's already been cleaned up there we go Shove it down in there. Oh, you can't really see what I'm doing. There we go. Put more grease on top of that. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. I want to put this. Um, so there's one of the things with these Delco fans is there's a tiny little ball bearing. It's easy to lose, and I have dropped this bearing on the floor three times. Three times I've lost this bearing. The first time I found it on my bench and I didn't know what it was there for. I'm like, what, what is this here for? What, what purpose does it have? I don't remember seeing it during the disassembly and I don't know where it came from. What is the deal with this ball bearing? <laughs> what is the deal with this ball bearing? 
Well, it turns out it goes to the fan and actually drops into this uh, machined brass fitting. And what it is, it's the bearing that uh, the counter shaft rides in, or rides on, or against. It's a critical piece. Without it, uh, the counter shaft would have so much play it would basically be doing nothing. So, important stuff, guys. Important stuff. There's my good screwdriver. Now I did lacquer this um, fitting. I think it looks great. You may disagree. I don't care. We're gonna just screw this in. And just kind of work it in there. Okay, that's too tight. That's wanna get in there and kind of loosen it up so that this shaft doesn't really have a lot of play and then it spins nice and freely. This is probably a little little tight and that's why you know that's why it's so controversial because this grease may be in fact a little bit too thick but once it heats up it'll be alright. Another critical step once you have the um, oops once you have this uh, in the right position you want to lock it down with this set screw here Okay, good, good, good. All right, now it's time to put the cover on. When working with old, um, especially cast metals like this. You don't want to go too tight on anything. The meta, the technology that they had for metals back then was nowhere near what it is today. Um, so the metals back then were often more susceptible to um, just stripping out. So just keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> but I'm happy with it and that's all that matters, right? While I'm in here, I'm going to go ahead and pre-lubricate the uh, oil pad. What that does is this little felt pad in here it soaks up all the lubrication for that rear motor bearing, or that rear motor bearing, the rear bearing. For my next trick, I'm going to be installing the front bearing. Now for this, I'm going to put a little bit of oil in there while we have it apart. Just kind of prime the pump. Let's get it around the bearing there. And earlier we can introduce oil to this uh, dry bronze bushing the better. Alright, I'll get some in the back here. Any excess oil will of course drain back to the um, to the felt pad, felt wick. There we go. You can put too much oil in a fan motor. Yes, you can. That's, that's always been true. Okay, so right here I've got the oil um, oiler. I'm going to toss my uh, oil wick and spring in there. These have all been cleaned. Brand new oil wick. I'm going to put a little bit of oil in there. So we talked a little bit about the uh, grease used in the um, in the rear gearbox. Let's talk a little bit about the oil that you're going to use uh, for your non-grease applications. So I've always used three-in-one in the blue can. This is a fractional horsepower motor. A lot of fan collectors swear by this, as do I. 
Um, it's just a, it's easy to get. You'll never have a hard time finding it as they sell it in every hardware store. Um, you can even get it, I believe, at Walmart. Um, so it's not hard to find. And um, it's a good quality oil. I've used it in all the fans that I run throughout the house and I've never had a problem. I've never had a fan melt down because of it. But again, it's a very touchy subject for some people. And I understand. So I went ahead and replaced, uh, replaced, I painted the armature gray on the ends. I figured, you know what? This is my restoration, this is my project, this is my party and I can paint it gray if I want to. You would paint it gray too if it happened to you, right? Um, so that's what I'm doing here. Get that wick come on down. There we go. Come on down. There we go. Okay, look at that. It's not really all that visible, but if you're looking in there, if you're checking out the details, you're gonna see that. I wanted to paint it red, but I don't have any red paint. Odd. I usually have red paint for something, but I don't today, and uh, so no red paint for you. Um, you know, it's the little details that people notice, though. If they're really looking, you know, little details. One thing I want to point out, though, I hadn't seen this before. I didn't. Have, I hadn't noticed it before on any other fan, but in this particular one, the. Um, the flutes going through the uh, the armature, they're cut at an angle. That way. So they're drilled at a, at a probably maybe five degree angle or some shit. Anyway, so what that really does is it, as far as I know, it, it allows it to catch the air a little better as it's being blown through so the air is able to flow through it better than if it were to be cut straight through. So I went ahead and I bought an assortment of grommets from uh, Vintage Wire and Supply Co. And they're usually pretty good for a lot of these weird hard to find parts. Um, they also make reproduction fan wick material which is just a, a felt rope. But they do sell an assortment of grommets in a variety of sizes. And uh, I'm just hoping that one of these is going to fit. Because sadly, the original grommets have been out of production for, for decades. Um, They're likely custom made for the application and you can't get those anymore. This one's a little bit too beefy uh, for the location, but it'll do the job. It's not really what I wanted, but it has just the right inner diameter to fit the hole. And I don't think anyone's really gonna judge me for using a grommet that's too big. And if they do, they can go to hell, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Okay, well anyway, so that should take care of that one. And now we can go ahead and slide the motor cover back in place, which will be kind of nice. Uh, let's do that. Yeah, all right. I'm gonna just put the wire in there. There we go. Should just slide right in. It's absolutely critical though that you actually do use grommets and some people might want to you know cut corners here and there and just you know wing it put it together without any grommets and that would be a mistake in my opinion that, that could be a very bad mistake if you could end up with a short circuit um, you know, the wire was never meant to chafe against bare metal so all right that motor should assemble nicely we're gonna 
find the bolts for that, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just get it done. The rotor should spin nice and freely. Make sure it doesn't chafe against any wiring. Like that, you know. Okay, so I've already cleaned up all my bolts. It'll help me index the uh, two halves of the motor so that they're lined up correctly. Let me just angle my camera here. That's that one. Okay, I think the, uh, the split washers. It's going to be a very, very beautiful fan. You can already see it. Once I get it polished up and waxed, it's going to look even better. It's going to be very nice, very beautiful. This will probably, you know, with the exception of the 1918 GE that I did, this will be the most beautiful fan to ever leave my workbench. And that's, you know, the one that came out the best, I think, but the best one that I ever restored was the Victor fan that I actually raised from the dead. I did a 1930-ish Victor desk fan. It was, it was given to me by a friend, and um, it was in very, very, very rough shape. I had declared it unrestorable at one point because it just had so much rust. And it was in, it was horrible, horrible, horrible condition. But at the end of the day, I took it apart. I mean, the bearings were seized. They were rusted solid. And um, I just took it apart and I looked it over and I realized that, wow, the coil is still good. I, I tested that with a multimeter. The coil was just fine. No, it wasn't open short, opened or shorted. It was just fine. So I said, "Okay, what can we do about the bearings and the bearing and the, uh, the sorry the uh, the armature sta uh, shaft? Um, yeah, the motor shaft. You know, what can we do with that?" So I cleaned it up with a wire wheel, I think, and um, put some nice uh, proper oil in there and. Gave it a paint job and sure enough, it sprang right to life. I did not think that was even possible with that fan. That was, that thing was in really bad shape. But to this day, it is probably the best one I've ever done because it looks brand new. It runs like new. I use it at night. I, I actually have it running in my bedroom to help me sleep sometimes. It makes it that nice white noise that these old fans are good for. So I'm going to torque these screws down, go around the clock until they're all nice and tight. Make sure the shafts, look at how, look at how nice, look at how nice that thing spins. Can you see that? Oh, perfect. She runs perfect. Okay, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hook up the linkage for the oscillator drive. Now, this motor has two positions. You can see that. Uh, one for a shorter throw and one for a longer throw. And we're going to go with the shorter throw. Okay, so now, <laughs> ironically, enjoy a Coke with your super van. Anyway, uh, so. Now what we gotta do is get some Wallace and Gromits installed. Um, let's see if we can 
find some that fit these holes nice. Battery just died, so I just put a new one in. Okay, so I'm working the grommet around, but the wire will go right through it pretty easily. Next thing I'm going to do, I'd like to knot the wire, but I think that's going to be doable. So this wire is not easy to work with in terms of creating a, a you know a knot or whatever. prevent it from getting backed out. So here's what I'm going to do. For starters, I'm going to, since we're inside the fan now, we don't need this decorative gold sheathing. So we're going to take some shrink tubing and we're going to make a protective barrier. So let's do that. I had a piece already cut for this. It wasn't this big, it was one size down from that. It's going to do it. Let's see if this fits. Let's take that off. Okay. We're going to slide the shrink tube back between the braided section and the rubber sheath section and we're going to get our heat source out and we're going to shrink the tubing carefully. You don't want to use too much heat because it will burn. Again, this is to prevent the, um, the braided jacketing from um, fraying at the ends. That's exactly what it wants to do. That should be fine there. Now we have a perfect splicing opportunity here. Now we can easily splice this wire without too much fuss. I want to mention though, this wire is not UL listed. Most of this stuff is not UL listed unless it says otherwise. So keep that in mind. If you're producing stuff to resell, you need to disclose that, I believe. I'm not really sure if you do or not. I made that up. Okay. I got it figured out. So. Basically, what we've got going here is um, the switch plate. Our neutral motor and power mains go here. The hot from the motor goes here, and the hot coming in goes here. Not too bad. So, to make this all work out, I'm going to start off I think what I want to do though is I want to actually, yeah, why don't we do this? Why don't we get our soldering iron hooked up and we're going to do exactly what the manufacturer did. And we're going to use soldered connections. Pretty simple stuff here. Just going to roll this around like that. Give it a good twist. We need more wire than that. I need a lot of wire. So it looks like I'm not able to get the exact diameter on my splicing tool, but hey, what are you going to do? So what would they do? Well, they would tightly twist the wire like so. wrap it around something like this screwdriver 
And now the fun part, we're going to have to tin these connections. Waiting for my iron to heat up. I think it might be broken. Maybe a bad connection. Usually these uh, these units don't take so long. There we go. one. The, uh, the hot wire ended up not looking so pretty, but um, I know why that happened and I will correct that in the next one. What I mean is, you need to cut off more wire once, not chop it up multiple times. You know what I mean? It's all furry and all, but hey, who cares? Right? Tighten that down. With what shall I tighten it? I don't know. I don't have any wrenches down here. Yes, he's using the wrong tool. Point that out in the comments box, guys. Thank you very much. This is not the right tool. I know that. Okay, so there's that. Next, we've got the uh, neutral. That's going to go there. I think there'd be more than one washer. There isn't. Okay, now we've got to go ahead and prepare the um, power lead, the mains, as you call it in the U uh, in the UK. We've got to run this baby through one of the new grommets that I put in the side here and uh, why did I do that? Don't worry about that. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. Okay, unfortunately what I didn't want to see happen happened, <laughs> and we ended up we ended up bunching up the uh, material. So we're gonna try that again. Okay, I think I found the problem with my soldering iron. Um, <laughs> the uh, the tip was getting loose. Look at that. Feel the heat. Okay. Jesus. That's all it was. The tip was loose. I, I knew I had to do something about that, but I just thought I'd have a little more fun times. Okay. Uh, white to white, black to black. Washer in there, put the nut on there. Oh wait, no, I got that one. There we go. Okay. Let me get something 
more appropriate to tighten these lugs with. Okay, so let's see. Um, she runs now. You'll see that I've uh, I've actually soldered both lugs on my plug, and a little bit of my uh, shrink tubing is still exposed. I do that on purpose. I don't want. Well, as far as the uh, the soldering, I, I I do that to prevent the screws from ever backing off at all. This is not the plug that came on the fan, but it was in better shape than the one that did. In fact, this one appears to be plastic, whereas this one is a, it's actually rubber. It's made of rubber, so. We're gonna do a test run of the motor. I've got it in the off position. And this will be the first time that I've had this thing running since we started this whole project, so let's see what happens. Okay, no sparks so far. Here we go. Hi. Oh boy. Medium. And low. It works on all three speeds. And look at that spin down. Oh, so smooth. Such a smooth runner. Let's see if the oscillation works. If and how well. Of course, you can't hear it with my damn humidifier running, but you get the idea. Slow. Okay. She's a runner. Woo! Not right now. I don't know why they use so many washers, but it just seems a little excessive, you know. What I'm going to do, let's see what we got here. Completed for the first time since the day it was built. The Delco, I need to clean it up a little bit, but I'll do that in a second. Um, it's got some oil and stuff on it, but this is it. Such a beautiful machine. Such a very usable machine, too. It's holding its own quite well. Wow. I don't know why this hole is bigger than the others. Um, I thought at first it might have been for the wiring, but that doesn't seem to be the case because there was a grommet in this hole here, which is the one I used. But look at that, such a sleek machine. Okay, I've shut down the dehumidifier so we can get the full sound effect here. Um, but first start up since restoration. Ready, set, go. from the 
linkage in the oscillator, but that's okay. I'm not going to worry about that. You know why it's doing about 86 years old. I'm going to do the math here. I found an ad from 1932, so I'm going to give that as its birth date. So I think it's from about 1932. So 2000. He's 87 years old. Not bad. Not bad. She's a good old, she's an old girl, but she still blows air. The day she was born. Now you'll notice that the blades have a nice luster to them, and that's all thanks to the clear uh, lacquer that I applied. It looks so beautiful running. It's just amazing. It's amazing. Well, thank you all for watching, and I hope you all uh, have a great day.